much for coming out for the first lecture in our 2023 lecture series. It's so good to see so many of you here again this evening. And before I introduce our distinguished speaker, Max Adelson, um, I would like to just thank the American Frontier Culture Foundation for um, funding this wonderful lecture series. We have six lectures planned for you throughout the entire year. A schedule is over on the table in the back there. We also have, you can see on some of the backs of the chairs, a QR code that will take you to a very short survey, only four questions. We'd love to hear from you at the end of the lecture how, um, how you enjoyed it. Um, there are some paper copies over there as well, and I've already collected several responses to the lecture, so. <laughs> But without further ado, I would love to introduce um, our speaker. Um, S. Max Adelson is professor of history at the University of Virginia. His research examines the spatial history of early America with a special focus on mapping and empire. He is the author of Plantation Enterprise in Colonial South Carolina and The New Map of Empire, How Britain Imagined America Before Independence. A finalist for the 2017 George Washington Book Prize. He is co-director of the UVA Early American Seminar and creator of Map Scholar, a digital platform for map history. And I would like to read you uh, just two sentences from a review about Max Edel Dr. Edelson's book. The new map of empire is a masterpiece of originality, conceptualization, research, and exposition. I cannot think of another book in early American history from which I learned more about Anglo-American geopolitics. So we're in for a treat. Please welcome Dr. Edelson. Well, uh, thank you, Dorat, and thank you to everyone here at Frontier Cultural Museum for hosting me, and thanks to all of you for coming out, and uh, I hope you like maps, because I've got a lot of maps to show you. Um, so uh, today's topic is about the proclamation of 1763 and the way it affected Virginia. This is a uh, very much connected to the book that Dorit mentioned, uh, The New Map of Empire. There'll be a slide at the end of the lecture that has some information about the book and a free website with all the maps uh, that the book references uh, if you want to look at that. I am still interested in the proclamation and um, with another scholar we're starting a new research project to look at the proclamation of 1763 in kind of a global context. So I'm very interested in revisiting uh, some of this work again and thinking about where I can take it from here. So let me make sure my clicker is working, I think it is, and let's get going. Um, on October 7th, 1763, King George III issued a royal proclamation. More than any other document, this one defined British America in the generation before independence. The King's proclamation imposed a new geography for empire after the Seven Years' War, known as the French and Indian War in America. Britain's great military victories on land and sea forced its rivals, France and Spain, to grant huge new territorial sessions at the war's conclusion. The proclamation was an act of royal law that did many things to shape Britain's American empire. It defined the boundary of, boundaries of new colonies, it planned their governments, and it gave soldiers generous grants of American land. But for Virginians, one provision of the proclamation caught their attention the limit it imposed on Western settlement. The King's proclamation read, the several nations or tribes of Indians with whom we are connected and who live under our protection should not be molested or disturbed in the possession of such parts of our dominions and territories as not having been ceded to or purchased by us are reserved to them as their hunting grounds. No governor in any of our colonies in America should grant any lands beyond the heads or sources of any of the rivers which fall into the Atlantic Ocean from the west, or upon any of the lands whatever which, not having been ceded to or purchased by us, are preserved to the said Indians. In other words, the king's order, the king's proclamation, prohibited colonial governors from granting new lands west of the peaks of the Appalachian Mountains, as well as in any other place uh, that could be claimed by Native Americans as their territory. The proclamation defined for the first time an interior boundary to the British colonies in North America. Modern historians have given this limit a name. They call it the proclamation line. This evening, I will show you what happened when the proclamation line reached Virginia and how negotiations and conflicts over its course paved the way for the American Revolution. Historians once saw the American frontier as the edge of civilization 
They described it as a clear north-south line that stretched across the continent and moved steadily to the west. In his famous 1893 lecture, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, Frederick Jackson Turner proclaimed an end to the American frontier. In his view, the settlement of North America had advanced so far by the end of the 1890s that there was no longer a clear division between land that was settled and land that remained, in his mind at least, open. Today, historians reject Turner's view of the frontier. They no longer regard native occupied lands as wilderness. They have realized that while it's easy to draw a line on the map of the continent, this line was never clear to those who interacted with one another across the real spaces of North America. Drawing lines across a map meant little to those at ground level, especially in remote places far from centers of power. The more we see the frontier as a space of interaction rather than division, the closer we get, in my view, to important truths about early America. Just over 250 years ago, however, the British made an attempt to pin down the frontier and draw a clear line across it. Today, I want to tell you the story of the proclamation line and the crucial importance of Virginia to its history. At the end of the French and Indian War in 1763, Britain proposed the line to keep the peace between expanded colonies and native societies. All, of all the colonies, Virginia had the most to lose by limiting Western settlement. Its officials worked to maximize Virginia's territory as the line was conceived, negotiated, and surveyed. I will show you how the line defined the edge of Virginia and the Cherokee Nation and why and how its course changed. The story of the Proclamation Line in Virginia is the story of how Native Americans, American settlers, and British officials imagined geography on the frontier. Each group saw the line as a threat as well as an opportunity, a chance to redraw the map of empire to secure the futures that they wanted. Before I show you the maps that the British made to trace the Proclamation Line across Virginia, I'd like to talk about a different kind of map. In the 1720s, so decades before the Seven Years' War and the Proclamation, a Catawba Indian leader painted a map of his nation's towns and their relationship to the rest of North America on a deerskin. He presented it to British Governor Francis Nicholson of South Carolina. The map shows 11 Catawba towns as circles. Non-Catawba places appear at the edges of this network. And uh, so here you see the Catawba towns in the center, and here are the Cherokees and the Chickasaw uh, on the edge. In addition to the circles uh, representing the Cherokees and the Chickasaws, the mapmaker also included two British colonial places. The maze-like grid on the left is Charleston, South Carolina. I think about this map a lot because uh, if you can imagine being a Catawba Indian uh, coming to Charleston, South Carolina in the 18th century uh, to have a diplomatic meeting, um, you don't live in a society with rectilinear streets uh, like Charleston, South Carolina. So I like the way that they pictured the city they remembered as this kind of confusing grid with lots of sharp angles in comparison to their own towns uh, in the interior. So we see Charleston, South Carolina as this maze-like grid on the left. The square in the lower right is Virginia. Um, so I think this is kind of an interesting contrast as well. So uh, there's clearly a difference between the way this native mapmaker is representing a native communities as circles and British communities as squares, but that doesn't mean that they are so far apart that they can't be connected together. So I think this is an important map for that reason. So what was the message that this Catawba leader wanted to send to the British with this map? First, it is a map that invited interaction. The only lines on this map are lines of connection, not division. The double lines on the Catawba deerskin map are paths and roads that link native towns and European settlements to one another. At the same time, this is a map that insists on native autonomy. Each Indian community remains distinct and separate buffered by empty space. Throughout the colonial period, Native Americans wanted trade and connection with Europeans, but not at the price of giving up their independence. This map, one of a few surviving indigenous maps of North America, pictures these core values. The idea of the proclamation line emerged during the French and Indian War at a time when the British were desperate to persuade Native Americans to side with them rather than the French. 
The British understood that the price of alliance was a promise to respect native lands and restrict colonial encroachment. At the war's conclusion, native people understood their vulnerability in a world in which Britain stood alone as the sole imperial power in eastern North America. A confederation of Great Lakes Indians under Pontiac attacked British forts in April 1763, demonstrating native hostility to the idea of British domination in North America. By the time George III issued his proclamation in October, British officials made peace with Native Americans the linchpin of their plan for America. The best way to secure peace, they believed, was to limit the Western expansion of the colonies. As British officials formulated the proclamation of 1763, they sketched out the very first image of the proclamation line in a report to the king. This map sits at the UK National Archives at Kew. It is a hand-colored and annotated copy of a popular map by Emmanuel Bowen that was rushed into print in 1763. If you were a British subject eager to celebrate the great victory in the Seven Years' War, you might have uh, gone to a Fleet Street print shop and purchased this map kind of as a patriotic memento to celebrate the war's conclusion and Britain's great victories. If you had kept up with the news of the war, if you were still reading and purchasing printed accounts of the battles uh, that made this war so historic, if you followed the treaty talks that were taking place in Paris to determine the peace, you would have found this map useful. It shows all the places that the great powers of Europe traded at the negotiating table in Paris. Above all, this was a map that celebrated the grandeur of the British Empire in America in 1763. It shows the king's dominions on the continent stretching from the Atlantic coast all the way to the Mississippi River. It includes blocks of text here uh, printed uh, in the Atlantic Ocean. These are actually provisions from the Treaty of Paris that uh, show the legal language by which these new territories were granted to Britain. British officials at the Board of Trade, the Board of Trade was basically the committee that was in charge of overseeing the colonies and formulating colonial policy. So British officials at the Board of Trade purchased a copy of this map. They colored it by hand in their offices, and they submitted it to King George III on June 8, 1763, with an extensive report on how to deal with the new territories in America. The map illustrated the geographic provisions of their plan for the post-war British Empire. So you can see some of the details on this map. I'll highlight some others. So this pink-colored wedge up at the top, that's the new British colony of Quebec. Uh, it is a revision of the way the French had conceived of New France as a much more expansive colony. And you can see also um, down here uh, Florida, which had been a Spanish province. Now you have the British colony of East Florida here and West Florida, uh, sort of on the panhandle going all the way to the Mississippi. The blue colored band that we see here stretching from Nova Scotia all the way to Georgia shows the parts of North America that were possessed, mostly settled uh, by the British. Um, for our purposes, what's most important about this map is the red line that's drawn across the continent. The report this map illustrates urged the king to fix upon some line for a western boundary to our ancient provinces. For the most part, this line follows the peaks of the Appalachian Mountains, at least as they were represented on Emmanuel Bowen's map. But when it reached Virginia, the line veers dramatically to the west through the mountains, terminating at the Ohio River. Let's zoom in on this small portion of the map that covers the Virginia frontier. If you look closely, you can see the logic of this line. It's drawn through the mountains between the headwaters of the great river systems, one that, ones that flow to the Atlantic coast, separating those from those that flow to the Ohio, to the Mississippi, and into the Gulf of Mexico. That was in the very language of the proclamation of 1763. But when the proclamation line here reached uh, the territory claimed by Virginia, this pattern changed. The line followed the course of the Canal River all the way to the Ohio River, a large tributary of the Mississippi. Why did Britain extend the territory of Virginia so much further west than the other colonies in 1763? Why did it extend colonial territory across the Appalachian Mountains in violation of the key principle of the proclamation? Why was Virginia an exception to the geographic rule that the proclamation laid down? 
Even before the king proclaimed the proclamation, Virginia had pre-existing land claims that complicated the idea of drawing a straight line across the Appalachian Mountains. A dozen years before the proclamation, surveyor Joshua Fry documented that settlers had already reached the headwaters of all of Virginia's rivers that flowed into the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, many had already moved beyond this geographic threshold. By 1751, several hundred were already settled along the Great Kanawha. Virginia's original tidewater counties had defined the colony for much of the 17th century. By 1634, these counties took in most of the land in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Once territory was enclosed by the boundaries of a British colony in America, governors and colonial councils could legally grant land to colonists within those boundaries. So in 1634, the only place you could legally get a grant of land in Virginia was within these tidewater counties that had been formed. So let's jump ahead to uh, about a century. By 1726, new counties in the 18th century provided a new legal framework for new grants of land deeper in the interior. By 1738, this changed dramatically. Virginia created the original boundaries of Augusta County in 1738 to encompass all of the western lands within Virginia's charter that were south of the Ohio River. Years before the proclamation, Virginia governors had granted land already within Augusta County, including grants of land along the Ganaw uh, River. By the rules of British land law in Virginia, these were entirely legal and above board. British officials knew about these Virginia settlers and their Western claims. This is why the first map of the proclamation line bends inward when it reaches Virginia to acknowledge and encompass these legal land grants that were west of the mountains. Virginia's history of Western expansion, as well as its motivated population of colonists and land speculators, made it impossible to simply draw a line down the mountains. If you were around in 1763 and looked at this map and thought to yourself, maybe Virginia's going to be a problem with this whole proclamation line, you would be right. And that's the subject of the rest of my talk tonight. To make the king's vision of a boundary between the colonies and Indian country a reality, it would have to become more than just a line that the Board of Trade drew across a map in London. To make a true boundary, the British and the Indians would have to agree upon its location and go into the landscape to survey it. Between 1763 and 1775, the British conducted more than a dozen formal diplomatic meetings with Native American leaders. These congresses, as they were called, were convened to turn the proclamation's vision for British America into a reality on the American frontier. Thousands of Native participants walked hundreds of miles to attend these events, the first of which was held at Fort Augusta in Georgia on the Savannah River in the fall of 1763. Native crowds gathered at these congresses to hear Britain's Indian superintendents read the terms of the proclamation and explain them. Indigenous leaders met with British officials to work out rules for travel, for trade, for law and justice on the frontier. And at every meeting, they always discussed the boundary line, the exact geographic location that they agreed to where the line would pass. By 1768, a truly continental line was beginning to emerge. The Board of Trade submitted a new map to the king in this year. This is the map you see on the screen. One that showed the progress made in turning the proclamation from an idea into a reality. This map summarized five years of negotiations aimed, as they put it, at fixing a boundary between the settlements and the Indian country. Across the southern Indian district, much of the boundary was, quote, marked out by actual surveys, unquote. I've highlighted these on the map to make them a little more visible. In the north, negotiations with the Iroquois had worked out the basic terms of a line of separation. All that remained to do to, com to complete this great work of diplomacy was to set the boundary between the Cherokee Nation and Virginia and convene a new ra round of Indian Congresses to ratify and survey this agreement. The Cherokees met with British Indian Superintendent John Stewart at Hard Labor Creek in South Carolina in 1768. There, Cherokee leaders proposed that the boundary between Virginia and the Cherokee Nation should follow the natural course of the Kanawha River. This was exactly the boundary that was marked on the first map of the proclamation line. Virginia's new governor, Norburn Berkeley, the fourth Baron Botetat, rejected this line, 
He said it was too restrictive. A boundary that followed the course of the river, he argued, would threaten Virginia's security by passing too close to its settlements. It also betrayed promises made to colonists who were already settled on the western banks of the river, lands that would now be thrown into Indian country under the Cherokee plan. In response to this British demand, the Cherokees retracted their proposal. They agreed that both sides of the Kanawha should be located on the Virginia side of the boundary. On the map, you can see how the line negotiated at hard labor defined the Virginia frontier. From south to north, this dashed line begins at John Chiswell's lead mine near the Virginia-North Carolina border. It ends where the Kanawha River joins the Ohio River up at the top. Another final landmark was the spot marked Cherokee on the map. You can see that right here. This was Long Island, a well-known Cherokee trading site. It remained well within the bounds of the Cherokee Nation. Boundary negotiations with the Indians in this period had two parts. At the Congresses, the two sides consulted maps, discussed landmarks, and offered proposals and counterproposals until they came to an agreement on where the boundary line should be located. Once these agreements had been completed, something truly extraordinary happened. The next part of this process was the commission of a formal survey. British surveyors with native representatives walked the land together. By doing so, Indian observers could see with their own eyes that the land's location that was specified at the treaty talks matched up with the real landmarks in the landscape. Together, Europeans and Native Americans cleared away brush and used their hatchets to notch marks on trees to show the, tr the course of the surveyed boundary. When they surveyed a line through North Carolina, for instance, they used the peak of Mount Tryon as a landmark for the Indian boundary line. On the trunk of the highest tree on this peak, British surveyors carved the Royal Cipher GR, which stands for Georgius Rex, King George. On the colonial, on the, um, that was on the colonial facing side of that tree trunk. Native participants carved their personal marks, the same ones they used to sign the treaties, on the Cherokee facing side. Anyone who ascended Mount Tryon uh, and saw this tree and its markings understood exactly where the boundary line was. Even after this agreement was completed and the line surveyed, Badatat argued for additional sessions of land that would give Virginia more western territory. Some British officials wanted to believe that once the boundary was surveyed, it would remain exactly where it was marked forever. But just as the Cherokee Nation had the right to negotiate the boundary in the first place, they also had the right to renegotiate it. Virginia's governor seized on this possibility when he wrote to London with a plan for acquiring additional lands beyond the boundary that Virginia would attempt to purchase in the future. Governor Badatat's vision for a more expansive Virginia set the stage for a new round of negotiations with the Cherokees two years later. At the Lockerbur Congress in South Carolina in 1770, Virginia asked for more land again, and the Cherokees complied again. Here you see the map that Indian Superintendent John Stewart sent to London to illustrate the changes in the boundary made at the Lockerbur Congress of 1770. Here I've highlighted the original boundary negotiated at the Hard Labor Congress in 1768 on Stuart's map. The dotted line shows the new boundary agreed at Lochabar in uh, 1770. This new line veered sharply for the west for 100 miles when it reached the North Carolina-Virginia border. The new line terminated at the same location as the Hard Labor Line, the juncture of the Kanawha and Ohio rivers right here. This giant triangle it formed added hundreds of thousands of acres of native land to Virginia's territory. But the Cherokees did not give up everything the English asked for at the Lockerbur Congress of 1770. I've added a red oval here so you can see this one little scrap of land they refused to give away. Indian Superintendent John Stewart asked the Indians for Long Island um, to be included within the lands that they were willing to give to Virginia. Long Island is a narrow, four-mile-long scrap of land in what was then called the uh, Holston River, located in what is now Kingsport, Tennessee. Here's a detail from the original map. Although the Cherokees yielded on every other point, Stuart reported that, quote, no consideration would make them consent, unquote, to give up Long Island. The agreement they signed at Lockerbur specifically stated that the boundary survey was to be begun six miles to the north of the island. And when it came time to do the survey, Long Island was chosen as the spot where Indians and surveyors would uh, join together to begin it 
perhaps to make sure that it wasn't accidentally surveyed away. They wanted to make sure that they kept Long Island. Once the Lockerbie Congress ended, the British appointed Colonel John Donaldson to survey it. Some of you may know about Colonel John Donaldson. His daughter became Andrew Jackson's wife. Uh, there was a famous controversy over that that I, uh, uh, was subject of another lecture for the future. Um, just as British and native surveyors marked the course of the previous line, John Donaldson was joined by Cherokee representatives, including a famous Cherokee leader named Atta Kula Kula, also known as the Little Carpenter. The boundary surveyed by Donaldson and Atacula Kula diverged wildly from the geography agreed to at the Lockerbie Congress. Instead of terminating the line at the agreed upon point, the juncture of the Ganaw and Ohio rivers, the boundary survey marked it hundreds of miles downriver where the Louisa River joins the Ohio. So here is the original map that John Donaldson uh, created to document this survey that he sent to London. Um, it's uh, hard to read, so I'm going to uh, provide some annotations so we can follow along uh, with this drama. So here I've uh, located, georeferenced this map on a modern base map uh, to, to show you the, the space it represents. And here I've, uh, I've annotated it to show you the different lines that I'm talking about. So what you can see by looking at this map is how dramatically the surveyed line changed the location of the boundary line. This map shows the line approved at the Lockerbie Congress and the new line surveyed by Donaldson and Atacula Kula. It also shows the location of Long Island, here labeled the Big Island, right here. The survey added some 10 million additional acres of land in present-day Kentucky to Virginia's Western Territory, land that was not agreed upon in the formal negotiations at Lockerbie. So why did the Cherokees, who were represented by Atacula Kula and others at the survey, agree to such a huge new session of land that they were not required to give? Atacula Kula was actually asked this question, and when he was asked, he said, some of our brothers, English colonists, were settled beyond the line, and we took pity on them. So that was his official explanation. It's not a very persuasive one. To answer this question, let's look at all of the lines that defined Virginia's frontier in sequence. It shows exactly how the boundary negotiation process eroded the original position of the line into native land. So here is a, the rough position of that first proclamation line map that was drawn by the Board of Trade and presented to the king. You can see how the line made this big exception for Virginia that we've already talked about. Here is the line at hard labor that put the entire course of the Kanawha River uh, within Virginia's territory. Here is the official Lockabar line that was agreed to that created that big triangular wedge of land uh, that eroded uh, the Cherokee boundary a little bit. And here is the line as it was uh, flexed inward by the Donaldson survey to create all that new land uh, for Virginia. Looking at this in sequence, watching these lines move steadily into the interior illustrates a dynamic that historians have called dispossession by treaty. This is the idea that Europeans and the Euro-Americans who followed them used diplomacy to push land claims deeper and deeper into Indian country, pushing native people off their lands. Though this process was, at least by European and American terms, legal, it seemed to betray the promise at the heart of the proclamation, the idea that colonists and indigenous people could live side by side on their lands in peace with some kind of stability and predictability into the future. Ultimately, I think that this idea of dispossession by treaty does tell an accurate story of Western expansion and British America in the early United States, but it doesn't explain all the dynamics that I've shown you so far. We can also use these maps to understand with a little more depth and complexity the Cherokee strategy for survival in the generation before the American Revolution. And to do this, we need to return to that little scrap of land on the Holston River that the Cherokees refused to give away, Long Island. John Stewart drew a map in 1764 that located the Cherokee Nation in relation to British colonies and other native nations of the South. And I have to say, um, this is one of the only maps that shows native peoples actually having nations with boundaries that encompass their whole territory. Uh, when you look at old maps of early America, you often see what uh, map scholars call uh, ethnonyms, basically the names of tribes drawn across space they almost never have boundaries, right? Because from a European perspective, 
these native nations had the right to own the land they lived on, but they weren't real governments, according to Europeans, they weren't real states, they weren't real nations. This is one of the only maps that actually creates boundaries around not only the Cherokee Nation here, but also the Chickasaw Nation, the Ch Choctaw Nation, and the massive uh, boundaries of the Creek Nation. Um, it's only a manuscript map, and I, I just kind of imagine what it was like when the clerks at the Board of Trade unrolled this map. They saw a map of North America unlike anyone they ever saw before, a map in which colonies with their boundaries stood next to native nations with their boundaries. So in my mind, this is a vision of, of what was behind the proclamation, this idea that it's one big British empire for everyone. There are going to be colonists living in their colonies, Indian nations in their colonies. They're all going to be bounded spaces. They're all going to be kind of permanent bounded spaces. You've probably never seen a map like this before because it didn't make it onto the published maps. It didn't seep into British and American consciousness as a boundary that they had to respect. Um, it was an idea that died when the proclamation died, I think, as well. That's a bit of a digression. So let's get back to uh, John Stewart and the map of the Cherokee Nation. So um, let me orient you to what's going on in the Cherokee Nation. So we see the location of Long Island right here uh, that's labeled on the map itself. And the blue boundary uh, shows the uh, total extent of uh, the Cherokee Nation. So John Stewart drew this map in 1764. It located the Cherokee Nation in relation to the other nations and the British colonies in the south. If we zoom in on this picture, we can see the clusters of upper and lower towns where most Cherokee people live. So here you can just make out the, uh, the, 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 the boundary that John Stewart drew to surround the Cherokee Nation. And the language he used, it's not just Cherokee written across space, it's the Cherokee Nation, right? Uh, so, but we see more detail here by looking closely at the map. So the Cherokee people are living in these clusters of towns. They're almost like little nations within a nation. And you can see them all uh, uh, outlined on this map. There are a couple of British forts here, Fort Prince George, uh, Fort Loudoun uh, uh, as well. Um, here we have Long Island right here uh, labeled on the map. And above uh, the river um, is uh, the Cherokee hunting grounds. Uh, and here we also see the Virginia settlements along the Ganaw River up in the upper right. So north of the Holston River was a large area. We can see it labeled the Cherokee Hunting Ground. One reason that Long Island was significant was that it divided the Cherokee Nation into these two spaces. The towns where Cherokee people lived in the south and the forests where they hunted for deer to the north. So we can create a new annotated map uh, based on John Stewart's map that shows these two parts. The red circle is the one I want you to pay attention to because I'm going to reproduce this red circle on more maps so we can see the relationship of the Cherokee towns, um, the homeland of the Cherokee nation in relation to some of these uh, negotiated lines. The blue boundary is the entire nation. And here we can see Long Island kind of dividing those two spaces. So the red circle shows the populated area of the Cherokee Nation. The blue circle, the boundaries that include the hunting grounds and the whole territory. The Cherokees used Long Island as a landmark. As long as they could keep the British from settling uh, beyond it toward their towns, they believed they could preserve a viable space for their nation. Although this map acknowledges the vast land claims of the Cherokee Nation, the Cherokee people, in fact, faced serious threats to their corporate integrity and even their very survival. From a population that may have approached 20,000 souls earlier in the century, smallpox and war had reduced the Cherokees to fewer than 7,000 by the time of the proclamation. As their population declined, the Cherokees experienced the approach of speculators and settlers as a deeply disturbing threat. When they spoke at the Indian Congresses, Cherokee leaders returned to the same idea again and again. The white people were too close to their towns, too close to their homes, and too close for comfort. One of the cool things about studying these Indian Congresses is that there was always a translator writing down everything anyone said. And this is a kind of treaty process in which it's also the spoken word that is then later written down and published as treaty proceedings. So if you want a native perspective on what's going on during this period, these diplomatic meetings are a really good place to look because you have Indian speakers 
speaking their uh, point of view and that being recorded. And of course, there's all sorts of problems with the way their words are translated or mistranslated or shifted. But to me, as a historian, it's a very precious resource to hear Native people speaking in their own words about these issues. Atakula Kula spoke at several of these congresses. He told those assembled at Lockerbur how the approach of colonists felt to Cherokee people in the towns. In his words, it seems like stepping out of the door to be at the white people's settlements. He said, it seems like they're coming into our houses. Another Ch Cherokee leader, a man named the young warrior of Estato, reported that the Cherokees felt much cramped in by Virginia's expansion. The Indians had found paths trodden by Virginia people in the woods where they'd never seen them before. They felt like they could, quote, see the smoke of the Virginians from their doors, end quote. These sights and sounds and feelings of encroachment provoked a visceral response and sometimes actual frontier violence from a sense that the Cherokee homeland was being invaded by Virginia settlers. The Cherokees worked to build a new set of national boundaries that would keep the British at a safe distance. If we again look at the sequence of boundary lines that define Virginia's western frontier and put them in reference to that red circle around the Cherokee towns, we can see the logic in their choices. So here we have a map that shows the uh, red circle representing the Cherokee towns, and here is Long Island here. The first proclamation line maintained a safe distance from the Cherokee towns. The hard labor line preserved a buffer zone between the towns and the British settlements. The Lockabar line, even with huge new grants of Virginia, maintained this buffer zone. And the, even though the Donaldson survey line delivered millions of additional acres to Virginia, holding on to Long Island kept this buffer zone between the boundary and the towns intact. Despite pressure from the British, the Cherokees adamantly refused to give up Long Island. By holding on to it, the Cherokees created a pivot around which Virginians could legally settle, but that also kept them at least 100 miles from the, the edge of the Cherokee towns. In the short term, this strategy appears to have been successful. The Cherokee sessions opened a path for Virginia land claims that steered clear of the Cherokee towns. Yet these treaties exposed native neighbors to the north to new violence. As settlers and speculators advanced into this newly ceded territory, they encroached on the hunting lands of the Shawnees, the Mingos, and other native, native groups settled along the Ohio River. When violence broke out, Virginia's Lord Dunmore mustered 2,000 militiamen. At the Battle of Point Pleasant, the Virginians defeated a confederation of Ohio River Indian forces in what has been called Lord Dunmore's War. By deflecting Virginia's expansion toward the Ohio River, the Cherokees bought time to survive. The final group of maps I'll show you today show that this strategy worked to preserve Cherokee land until it didn't. These maps show the spread of colonial populations in reference to the Donaldson Line, Long Island, and the Cherokee towns. In 1740, settlers were, were still far from Cherokee territories. Places like Charlottesville and Stanton were just being settled as distant outposts from the heart of colonial territory. By 1760, settlers were spreading into the mountains and up river valleys closer to Cherokee lands. By 1770, colonists were already in the vicinity of the new boundary line. During the American Revolutionary War, the Cherokees sided with the British. American forces attacked the Cherokees at Long Island and drove them away in 1777. At the Treaty of Long Island, the Cherokees were finally forced to give up this vital place that was the linchpin to their strategy and all of the lands around it. Once Long Island was gone, the Cherokee survival strategy collapsed. After American independence, lines negotiated with the British no longer had any legal authority. Settlers moved past Long Island and toward the Cherokee towns. Such encroachments triggered violence. From 1776 to 1794, the Cherokee-American Wars, also known as the Chickamauga Wars, brought ongoing conflict to this frontier. Eventually, this forced the Cherokees to migrate south to northern Georgia, abandoning the towns that had been the center of their homeland for generations and that they had struggled so long by force and by diplomacy to defend. I'd like to conclude this talk by rethinking George Washington's role in this drama of treaties, boundaries, and lands. More than any other colony, Virginia was dominated by a gentry class committed to expansion through land speculation. 
Virginia's elite saw their province as an empire within an empire, an empire in miniature that was designed to grow in territory, population, and wealth. Colonists like Washington regarded the proclamation as a betrayal of their interests. They acknowledged that the territories in the West belonged to the crown, that the king could do what he wished with them, as they often said, but they were disgruntled that the proclamation's new boundary lines obstructed expansion. Active land speculators like George Washington also recognized that British authorities were in a difficult position. Great Britain had amassed a staggering national debt to finance the French and Indian War. If colonists were allowed to advance unchecked into Indian lands, they did not see how they could defend them. There was no money to pay for troops that would be required to put down the inevitable responses to encroachment and dispossession, violent indigenous attacks against remote forts and unprotected settlers. So it was important, especially in the wake of Pontiac's war, to keep the peace, even at the expense of prohibiting new grants of land that made people like George Washington unhappy. But Washington and others bided their time. They predicted that eventually the British would expand into the interior. In 1767, Washington wrote that he did not, quote, look upon that proclamation in any other light than as a temporary expedient to quiet the minds of Indians. Inevitably, he predicted, it must fall, of course, in a few years, especially when those Indians are consenting to our occupying those lands, that is, giving them up at treaty talks. Washington kept his own schemes for land speculation quiet during the era when the proclamation line negotiations were taking place, but he believed that, as he put it, quote, any person who neglects the present opportunity of hunting out good lands will never regain it. Washington followed his own advice. In 1770, he led a small land scouting party to mark out lands along the Ganal River. He helped the group survey over 64,000 acres of land divided into eight great tracts. Washington claimed about 20,000 of these acres for himself. So did George Washington violate the proclamation line by laying out these lands where he did? The answer is no. If we show Washington's survey map alongside the location of the renegotiated boundary line, we can see that Washington's land claims fell within the boundary. Washington did not violate the restrictions of the Proclamation of 1763 because the Cherokees had already ceded land to Virginia at the Indian Congresses. Although Washington's actions as a land specular, speculator did not violate Virginia law or British law, this does not mean they were entirely above board. The British never consulted the Ohio River Indians about the future of lands they claimed south of the Ohio River or the location of the boundary across it. And the re relentless process of speculation in new land, work that made Washington a fortune, destabilized the frontier and made it impossible for Native Americans to remain there for long. Decades before the, the proclamation of 1763, another famous Virginian, William Byrd, recalled a moment in colonial history when Virginia was the only English colony and could claim almost all of the continent based on its expansive charter. Byrd recalled almost wistfully that all of North America went at first under the general name of Virginia. New York, Carolina, Pennsylvania, these were all diminishments of his country's original grandeur. Each was, in his word, another limb lopped off from Virginia. Virginians were the last to come to terms with the Indians over the location of their boundary and the most determined to undermine it. More than any other colony, Virginia challenged the geographic idea behind the proclamation because of its substantial settlements west of the mountains. Over the course of the 1760s and early 1770s, Virginia's governors used settlements and grants along the Ganao River to keep Virginia's vision of reclaiming a vast American empire alive. The Cherokees faced this moment with a clear-eyed sense of the need to contain Virginia's expansion. They took the British at their word and engaged in negotiations to create a boundary with colonial America that they could live with. Although they failed to hold on to their homeland, the Cherokees were never duped or deceived. They were shrewd negotiators who put a bold strategic plan in place to create a buffer zone with British America. The coming of the American Revolution ended this strategy for survival, but it did not diminish this legacy. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating. Um, we're going to have a Q&A session. Um, I'm going to get us started with one question that I've been thinking about. 
Today, maps are pretty much ubiquitous. We all know what the world looks like. We know what Virginia looks like. Um, my understanding of space is also shaped by my own experience. I know how long it's going to take to fly from Germany to the United States. I know how long it's going to take me to drive to Richmond. Now, I'm wondering if people in the early modern period had a similar understanding of space and how much access did they have to maps back then as well. Mm -hmm. so. Right, so uh, I don't know. You're probably mostly history buffs in this room. I can, I can uh, gauge that to be true. So uh, if you've ever had this experience driving your children on a vacation saying, hey, it's the mighty Severn River we're passing, and they don't look up from their headphones or their iPads, that's, uh, that's sort of a little key into modern travel and the way it works now. It's what some people describe as frictionless travel. We only calculate the time it'll take us on a highway, and when anything deflects us from that schedule, we are very put out by this uh, delay. When people traveled in the colonial period, uh, they had no expectation of getting where they were going in any kind of set time. When you, when you had to cross rivers to get anywhere, you better hope the ferry was there or the bridge wasn't out or there wasn't a flood. Um, it took days. Uh, and one of the things that I, I learned by doing this research on the uh, proclamation line was that um, you know these Indian Congresses weren't, uh, were, were huge gatherings. Sometimes hundreds, even more than 1,000 Indians would come by foot over the mountains in a journey that took weeks because they needed to hear with their own ears what was being said to, to give that any credibility. Um, it didn't hurt that there were also um, presents given to Indians as well. And if you came to the meeting, you got to take home the, the textiles, the gunpowder, and, and other things. But, um, but this is just, there's a totally different mentality about uh, how to navigate. And maps are available in colonial America. Toward the end of the colonial period, increasingly available in cheaper editions that even less wealthy people could afford. And even if you couldn't own a map, let's say you're an enslaved person uh, who has no, virtually no property at all, you could still look at a map. If you saw it, that could change your view of the world, even if you never got to own it yourself. So maps, even the few maps that existed, are powerful ways that people orient themselves in space. and. Um, but they had a remarkable ability to navigate and wayfind in this world. Uh, most of the information, I showed you one Native American map at the beginning of this lecture. Uh, there are very few maps that have survived as actual objects. Most of the Native maps that have survived have survived because um, Europeans were lost and they, they met some Indians on the path and they asked for directions and the Indians would draw a map on the ground or uh, on the, you know, take some charcoal or something. Those maps are ephemeral. They have not lasted. But we have a text description of them. And what we learn from that is that Native Americans are expert wayfinders. And this is true for most um, uh, uh, people in most periods of human history. It is one of the most basic things that makes us human is our incredible capacity to find our way uh, across space. And one of the things I teach in my classes on map history at the University of Virginia is how um, for all of us, myself included, uh, we're all so dependent on our GPS devices, uh, we just follow what it tells us to do. And it has saved a lot of arguments with my wife. I'm grateful for that. But on the other hand, it degrades our sense of, of how to find our way in space. So some of the things I do uh, as a teacher is I will, um, I will ask students to sketch the route that they took to get to class and name the landmarks and post those, and we'll compare them. Um, I'll ask them to recall an experience of getting lost and how when you're off your commuter route because of construction or something, suddenly it's like, I don't even know where I am or where I'm going. And uh, so part of our challenge about being modern people, we have all this amazing technology. When it breaks down, um, how do we draw on those deeper human resources to get where we're going? I think it's profoundly different the way we live now. But when you show a line on the map that went from Long Island to the junction of the Catawba and the Ohio, it's a straight line. Mm -hmm. Did they actually negotiate that straight? I mean, did they, well, I didn't mean negotiate. Did they traverse that line and mark it in some degree? Or how was it? So the, 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 the completed boundary line that was basically done by uh, 1773 or so, um, portions of it were just compass bearings, right? So they were, those long straight portions uh, were compass bearings. They still surveyed it, 
but they just they, it wasn't as intensely surveyed because you could just use a compass and, uh, and and a sight line. But a lot of the other places, especially around uh, Florida, Carolinas, those are meticulously surveyed across the landscape. Literally, there'll be a 50 mile stretch where every hundred feet there'll be a, a tree that's notched to show the line and the name the the, the species of tree poplar, birch, red oak, will be written down so people can walk along that course and see it, right? So uh, there are big stretches where they just had to, to kind of visibly show the line uh, as a straight line, but a lot of others where they had to mark it uh, piece by piece. Well, second question is, uh, is there some particular reason that they drew it as a straight line? Wouldn't it have been, because I've been across a lot of country and it's like this. Mm -hmm. you know, wouldn't it have been a lot simpler if they had just said, draw it down the catwalk or one of its tributaries? And, you know, then up the Ohio or something. I yeah. Have been a visible, marketable yeah, well, as you saw from this talk, uh, sometimes rivers weren't acceptable locations to draw the line, even though they were natural boundaries that were easy for everyone to see. So there are reasons when, uh, there are reasons behind every part of the line. S one principle that guided these negotiations was the idea that uh, British settlers, wherever they were actually established, the line should go to leave them in colonial territory and add a little bit more for like one generation of settlers to, to keep moving, but no more. So that was one principle. Sometimes it followed the compass bearing, as we talked about. Sometimes it followed some kind of geographic marker. Uh, sometimes it followed human geography, so uh, trading posts that everyone knew about. Um, that was just a store on a crossroads. That became a site for the line. So it combined all of those together. And what was important is that both sides talked about it and could agree to it. Um, and so a few, uh, the original principle was kind of interesting and it was used in the boundary line. So especially for the Creek Indians, you saw that line like dipping way down into Florida. The principle the Creek Indians used for a lot of their boundary line was wherever there is salt water, that can be colonial territory. Where it's fresh water, that becomes native territory. And so there's very complicated negotiations to, to seed land in Georgia beyond that that have to be done meticulously. So you can see that native, I mean to, to me what's revelatory about looking at this in detail is how Native Americans are knowledgeable, savvy, uh, they, they, they have a clear sense of what they want to achieve at these negotiations. Their failure does have to do with bad intentions by the British and American colonists, but it wasn't because they didn't understand, it wasn't because they didn't try to survive. They used all the tools that they could to try to maintain their territories and it, well, it wasn't enough, but uh, it, it, it shows their, their intelligence, their persistence, and their engagement in this process. So the Ohio River Indians uh, were considered uh, by the um, British and the Iroquois Indians as junior partners that the Iroquois were in charge of. The Iroquois were kind of in charge of a lot of people, including the Delaware Indians who ended up migrating to the Ohio and uh, all the Ohio River Indians as well. And so uh, I didn't mention it in this talk, but the same thing that's going on with the Cherokees in Virginia is going on between the Iroquois and Pennsylvania and New York. They are also, uh, the Treaty of Fort Stanwix in 1768 helps do that northern portion of the line, and the Iroquois are doing the same thing. Head on over to the Ohio River. Uh, so one of the things we learned from this process is that we, sh we can't view native societies as a monolith. They all have a generalized similar interest in preserving territory against encroachment, but they don't regard each other as natural allies in this all the time, um, and often they are uh, really rivals with one another. So the Iroquois and the Cherokee see a moment where they can really sacrifice the interests of another group of, of Native Americans in order to protect themselves. And I think they do so because they're, I wouldn't say they're cynical, they always take part in this process, um, but they may not be as optimistic about the outcome here. Um, they understand the desperate position they're in and the powerful position that the British are in. And they, I think, know that the settlers are gonna come one way or another. So the question is how to make it so they survive. And uh, so yeah, I think the Ohio River Indians are the ones who pay the price.
Yeah, in fact, if you go out of this hall today, there's a map on the other side that shows the uh, more modern and the original boundaries of Augusta County, which is uh, interesting. So I think, you know, um, uh, I do want to visit that historical center and, and take a look at those maps, of course. Uh, so Augusta County, I mean, the way uh, British charters work typically, uh, not for all of them, for, but for most of the westward facing colonies, is they're defined by lines of latitude. Uh, they are not defined by lines of longitude. So they, they usually don't have a western boundary built into the charters. So uh, uh, there's some famous maps. I bet you have a copy of the John Mitchell map somewhere displayed around here. So there's famous maps that show the boundaries going all the way off the edge of the map, all the way to the South Sea, as they put it, the Pacific Ocean. Um, and of course, there's no English people out there. Native people live on that land. They've never seen an English person. No English person's ever visited them. The French are out there. They don't respect those claims. But the British aren't operating in indigenous law or French law. They're just operating into British law. So that's how that huge Augusta County boundary makes sense, right? Uh, the, the king has already authorized them to establish the uh, mechanisms of civil government, including counties, within the charter that they've been granted. That um, means that other British colonies cannot infringe on those boundaries. And there's often, you know, there's historic controversies like the one between the Penn family and the Calvert family about Maryland and Pennsylvania, about where the boundaries actually are. But, um, but once you have the boundaries, if you're willing to do what it takes to, to, to define those county boundaries, even one as ridiculous as the original Augusta County, you can do so. And that, I mean, this is important for our story because the way a lot of historians talk about land uh, of settlers is almost like they're, not, they're like a force of nature. They pour over the mountains like zombies in a zombie movie. You, and, and a line cannot stop them. A line on the map cannot stop them. But these settlers do not want to illegally settle on the land because they, I mean, some of them do, but eventually they'd like to own that land because if you own the land, you can legally sell it to someone. You can mortgage it. You can do all sorts of things with it. Um, it becomes much more valuable to you. And you're a British subject. You don't want to violate the law. You want to work within the law and be a proper British subject uh, and get the benefits of that, which include the appreciation of the value of your property and the ability of, to use it commercially. So um, I think uh, you know settlers are, in a sense, the bad guys in this story. But they also, just like the Cherokees, have a logic to their decisions, these settlers do as well. So the proclamation is a threat to them because what it's saying is you can go if you can survive, but nothing you settle will be legal. And for speculators and land, and land settlers, that's, that, that stops their business. That makes it impossible for them to do what they want to do. It really is a threat to them. It's not a threat that they can stop them. It's a threat that their land will be valueless. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm sure there were some Native Americans who learned uh, European surveying techniques. Uh, but Native Americans uh, before the early 19th century, uh, I would imagine that, I, I know this to be true, that by the time the Cherokee are trying to maintain themselves in Georgia, they're taking on the trappings of civil society. They're, they own slaves. They're uh, engaged in commercial agriculture. They're wearing Western clothes. They're practicing Western agriculture. They have an education. They have a legal system. They're trying to be as American as possible in order to survive. 
and I'm sure that they also used uh, modern surveying techniques. But for most of the colonial period, they do not use this. And that, that Catawba deerskin map gives you a sense of how Indians approach space. They, they knew where their lands were. And they had a deep and intimate knowledge with landmarks and physical geography and wayfinding. But um, they didn't make, they didn't, um, it wasn't, Indian societies weren't cheek by jowl together the way Western countries are in like Europe or the states of the United States. There was usually empty space uh, that was sort of owned by no one that you uh, kept as a kind of buffer. And so this is what makes the Cherokee strategy make sense as well. So there was no need to use those techniques to survey national boundaries or anything like that. Um, they, they didn't use those survey techniques to survey plots of land or anything like that as well until forced to by, um, by Europeans. So, uh, when the, so the Catawba who, who drew that deerskin map, uh, they were, um, at, the, at that first treaty, the first Indian Congress that I talked about in 1763 at Augusta, the, the Catawba were really reduced by the smallpox epidemic. And so they agreed to the first, one of the first Indian reservations, measured Indian reservations in uh, North America. And uh, so a surveyor came out, and um, if you know the map of uh, the border of South Carolina and North Carolina, there's a little square-shaped notch. Um, that is part of the boundary of the Catawba Nation that was created as the first um, real reservation. And so Indians took part in that. Uh, they accompanied surveyors to survey it. They knew where the line was. Um, and uh, those who survived within the boundaries of British America had to learn to use those techniques to survive. But it wasn't a natural part of their society or a necessary part of their society before that. Terrific. And all the original maps in there from the early 1600s all the way to 1800 to trace the American changes that were going on. And I do that by looking at Native Americans, indentured servants, religion, and the African slave trade. So there's all this stuff in there that I'm trying to get people to look at. It'll be open for another two or three weeks. It's been open for almost a year. Um, and maybe if you come over to the mountain, I'll give you a tour. I'd love that. That'd be great. Well, fantastic. Um, so I also want to invite you to come to UVA, where we have a fantastic new early American map collection, the Seymour Schwartz uh, collection of North American maps that I'm working with with students right now. So I hope you visit us as well. And if there are no more questions, I was wondering if you could just talk very briefly about your website, because I found that a really fascinating um, source for anyone who's interested in maps. Right, so as you've seen, I'm, I'm not just interested in the documentary history of this, I'm also interested in the visual history of it. And so I became a digital humanities scholar in order to show these maps. And so uh, with a team at UVA, we created a platform to do some of the visualizations that you saw tonight. All of those maps are available at mapscholar.org slash empire. They're all annotated. Uh, I would love it if you, you know, bought the book as well. And the book with the website together provide, I think, a pretty rich reading experience. But my goal in writing this book, the book itself doesn't have a lot of maps in it. There's just, there were too many maps to choose from, and I wanted to show just the range, the vitality, the super abundance of maps that, uh, that are off, often left out of this history. So um, the book is uh, available for purchase. Uh, the website is free, and I would encourage you to, to go over and look at it. I'm, uh, we're not really doing too much new development with Map Scholar, but I think the tool is still really effective, and it produced some of the visualizations you saw today. I am teaching digital humanities at UVA to students to do this kind of map history. I now use ArcGIS tools, which are really good for this purpose. I really believe that um, in another generation, we're going to be reading history really differently. Um, so right now, I've got a kind of... Um, you know, the traditional print book and then the website you consult alongside it. Those two things are going to come together, and I hope to produce scholarship that kind of leads the way in that direction. I think it's a pretty exciting development, especially if you're interested in maps and geography like I am. And we're very excited to see what else you are going to develop with your students, but thank you very much for coming here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for watching this talk. If you share our passion for early American history and would like to support free programs like this, please consider making a donation to the American Frontier Culture Foundation at frontierculturefoundation.org.
Thank you for your support, and we hope to see you in person at the Frontier Culture Museum in Stanton, Virginia.